Professor Schneider, I, I, you and I have just talked about this a few weeks ago, uh, but I think it was important to come back because Donald Trump on a daily basis now is doing things that shock those of us who don't think we can be further shocked. And the question is not that you shouldn't be shocked by it. It's what you are supposed to do about it. Uh, we were talking just this weekend about how he posted a picture of a truck that was decorated, uh, wrapped to look like Joe Biden uh, with a bullet in his head was hogtied in the bed of that truck. And some people say you're making too much of that kind of thing. What's the danger of normalizing this? Yeah, I, I, the, the problem is what Trump is doing is he's changing what is normal. He's getting us used to the idea that violent words, violent phrases, indirect threats, stochastic violence, that this is all, this is normal. And of course, our whole political system is based on the idea that you can have a constitution, a social contract, an agreement to hand over power peacefully. And so what one has to be able to do is to say, this is the kind of person who, if elected or who gets close to power, will automatically undo the system. And that's what one has to understand and be calm about it and make that a reason to make sure that this person doesn't get close to power. Get close to power is an interesting term. You made a reference to this in a recent article uh, that you wrote on your Substack. Getting close to power is not the same as winning power. Uh, you, you've made the point that Donald Trump is setting up a situation in which on November 5th, he doesn't actually have to win more votes than, than Joe Biden to achieve his goals. I don't think in any of these elections in 16 or 20 or 24, Trump has ever believed that he was going to win. And at every single time he said in one in one version or another that it was going to be stacked against him, people were going to cheat, it was going to be rigged against him. I don't think he has ever actually had the notion that he was going to win the popular the electoral vote. I think each time, but now with increasing violence and I think an increasing fervor and fear on his side, he's just tried to get close enough that he could stage something. I think he was genuinely surprised in 2000, in 2016 when he won. I think he was not surprised in 20 when he lost. He was ready for that. He'd been advertising for months that he was going to try something if he failed to win. And this time he's made it clearer than ever. He's making it very clear to us that his whole game is to just get reasonably close in November and then see what he can try to pull off. So we have more time to make sure that he doesn't get reasonably close. And also we have more time to try to head off the various extra legal things he could try in November. So let's, and, and you talk about this and you say, let's be calm, which is good. We don't have to, we don't have to lose, you know, our hair, hair doesn't have to be on fire about this, but you can't do nothing. You can't wish it away. You can't decide because you don't like to hear Donald Trump's voice that you shouldn't hear what he's got to say. So what's your guidance for people who really don't want to listen to Donald Trump? They don't, they don't believe they're going to vote for him. They don't believe he's going to win the election. What is the thing that we're called upon to do other than vote on November 5th? Yeah, that's such a great question. I mean, the most important thing is to do something, also because of your mood, because what Trump is trying to do, among other things, is to demoralize everybody. He's trying to make everything seem dirty. He's trying to make politics seem dirty. He's trying to make the good people seem just like him. You know, his whole strategy or part of his strategy is to try to make the Biden administration seem just like a version of him. Everybody's bad, so just pick your flavor of bad. But when you yourself do something good, some little thing, letter to the editor of the newspaper, conversation with somebody at a bar, phone banking, calling your congressman about legislation, any little thing that you do, campaigning for candidates that you care about, giving, donating money to people, especially down ballot, any little thing that you do then makes you feel better, especially if you do it with other people. And then you get a positive cycle going where you're doing something good and you're feeling better about doing something good. And then at the end, you win, but also you know that there are lots of people around you who are also trying to do good things. And so you, you end up on the right side, but then you're not demoralized. You're actually, you're happy at the end of it, something like that. Let's talk about us. Let's talk about journalism. Um, you, you've got you know, this is a time when we should be introspective. We should be trying to, to, to get this as right as we can. Uh, what are the things that we should be doing now in, in light of the fact that Donald Trump crosses new red lines on a daily basis? What's the way in which we cover this properly and provide the necessary context without being gratuitous or, or, or creating unnecessary fear? Yeah. And number one is good old fashioned, just covering what the man says and does. I don't think there has been enough. And we talked about this last time. I don't think there's been enough simple coverage of the rallies. People need to know that the rallies begin with um, an appeal to people who have been convicted of crimes. They need to know that the rallies begin from the premise 
that there should be a violent overthrow of the American system. That's how every single rally begins, and I don't think people know that. The second thing is, I, journalists have to accept that both sidesism is suicide for democracy. If you just say there are two sides to everything and I'm going to find my way into the middle, you're always going to give the people who want to overthrow the system an advantage because you're always going to be sharing your legitimacy with them. You're going to be giving your legitimacy to them. People have to be able to cover the election in such a way as to say, this person is A and this person is B, as opposed to I'm going to somehow find my way into the middle of them and give each side a voice. And it's really important, this is a third thing, not to talk about how the American people are divided. That makes it sound like, again, it's like one thing, one hand, uh -huh. other hand. It's not the people who are divided. It's that we have an extraordinary election in which we have an unusual candidate who has already tried to overthrow the system once and tells us basically every day that he's just aiming to get close enough that he can use violence to overthrow it again. That's what should be covered. Tim, we always appreciate it. Thank you for your continuing analysis. And I think we're going to have to have this conversation several more times before uh, November. Timothy Snyder is a professor of history at Yale University and an author of a number of important books that are uniquely relevant. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.